Hello, I'm Gregu, and this is a, hopefully, brief little video to explain normals, normal maps, and bump maps. What they are, how and where to use them, and why. Everything you'll see is coming out of Blender 3.0, and that's where I'll show you how to use this stuff. But the general concepts are pretty universal and should apply to different versions and other 3D packages. Without any further ado, let's get into it. In Blender, in most 3D software, pretty much every object we see and deal with is a mesh. That means that it's defined as a set of vertices, each in a specific position, alongside edges that indicate how those vertices are connected, and faces to indicate how the edges are connected. Now, when it comes to actually rendering these meshes, you'd assume the faces are all you'd need. If there's a face here, render it. Otherwise, don't. However, when lighting gets involved, things get a little more complicated. Let's say we have a really simple lighting system, and what it does is says, hey, when a face is facing towards the light, it gets brighter, and when it's facing away from the light, it gets darker. Now, this works pretty well if you ignore the lack of shadows or reflectiveness, but there's an issue. Take a look at this face. Is it facing towards or away from the light? It could be facing up towards the light, which means it should be bright, but it could also be facing the exact opposite direction, away from the light, which means it should be dark. Notice that in both of these scenarios, the geometry, the vertices edges faces, are perfectly identical. So we need some other kind of data baked into our mesh to solve this ambiguity. Enter normals. Normals are little XYZ vectors, think arrows, that show what direction each face is pointing in, and they are baked into the mesh, just like vertices, edges, and faces. In Blender, you can see them by going into Edit Mode, then Overlays, then at the bottom here, Normals. There are different ways to show them, which you can pick between, but I'll show face normals. Technically, normals are stored in vertices because faces are spook, but don't worry about it. That's very technical, and face normals are easier to understand. Turn the overlay on, you can see all the little lines coming out of my faces. Those are the normals. And now, looking at this face, we can see that it's facing away from the light and should be dark. And hey, so it is. Alright, so now I have normals, I guess, and that's like, cool, or whatever, but why should I actually care? Well, now that we have a value in our meshes that tells the rendering engine what direction everything is facing, we can mess with it to get cool results. Take this icosphere for instance. It is pretty low poly, so you can see every individual face really easily. If I wanted to make it look like a smooth sphere, my only option would be to add more geometry. And that kinda works, but it's still pretty obviously just a bunch of flat edges, and I need a lot of geometry to make that unnoticeable at reasonable distances. Now, getting rid of the subdivisions, we can look at the normals and think about how we might be able to smooth out the lighting without adding any more vertices. You can see that you get these hard edges in between faces because every face is pointing in a different direction. When you move from one face to another, the normal just instantly switches from pointing one direction to another. But what if instead of just instantly switching, we smoothed out the transition? So instead of the normals being uniform on a single face, they smoothly transition, or interpolate, from one face to the next. In Blender, there is a way to do this, and it's called smooth shading. So if I just head out of edit mode, right click, and click on shade smooth, boom! Now instead of easily visible individual faces, I just get a smooth line from light to shadow. Of course, this isn't perfect. At grazing angles, I get weird lighting on the faces, and you can clearly see that the outline is circular, but this is a really low poly ball, and if I zoom out a little, all the problems become basically unnoticeable. It's night and day between the smooth and flat shading, and suddenly, a little bit of subdivision will go a much longer way. Of course, this is just built into the way we display most meshes, but normals don't just work for smooth shading. We can also use them to create the appearance of extra small details in our mesh without adding any extra geometry. Now, you saw me manipulate normals inside of the mesh itself. That's more of a programmatic approach, just taking the data we already have and messing with it. But what if I could add extra data, use that to create the illusion of 3D details on a flat plane? Well, we already have textures for colors or roughness or whatever in our materials, so if we could find a way to encode normals into a texture, we could slap whatever normals we wanted onto any object regardless of the geometry. But what does this look like? Well, take a look at this plane. If I wanted to add a ridge in the middle of it, it would look something like this. And you can see in rendered view that this works great as a ridge. We can see a clear light and dark side, it just works. But the problem is that in order to get this ridge, I need to add a lot of geometry. And if I wanted this to be some small detail on a larger object, like some armor or something, adding all these loops and geometry density is a bit much for something so simple. If I wanted a lot of detail like this, my mesh could get out of hand very quickly. Looking at the normals, we can see how around the ridge it's flat, just pointing straight up, and on the ridge we have normals pointing every which way. If we could bring those normals down onto the flat surface and get rid of the extra faces, we could mimic this ridge. And lo and behold, that's what I've done. Now, it's pretty obviously not the same. The shadow on this side and the bounce lighting on this side are totally gone, and that's a trade-off you have to make with this kind of normal manipulation. It's not like it's terrible though. It still has light and dark sides that react to the light, and if we zoom out and look from a distance, the effect becomes a lot more convincing. In general, anytime you're doing normal manipulation, you will lose some quality in the effect. 
but the quality drops are more noticeable the bigger the detail and the closer you are. So usually, this kind of stuff is only reserved for really small details or when you're working under really tight polygon counts. We usually see normal maps in two places. One is like the example I showed earlier, where details are projected or baked down into a texture, and the other is when we download materials from the internet and they come with a normal map you can use to add depth and fine detail. I'm not going to touch baking here because that's a whole can of worms that could be its own entire video. So let's say I've downloaded this metal plate material off the internet and I want to use it in Blender. Here we can see the various textures associated with the material. It's got albedo, or color, roughness, height, which we won't use right now, but I'll get into later, and here we go, normals. Now, you might look at this crazy multicolored texture and go, how is that encoding direction? And if you'll excuse a brief tangent, let me explain. So here's an example normal map, where you can see the details pretty clearly. Now, the way normal maps were set up is that the directions a face could point in, x, y, and z, are attached to the three color channels in an image, red, green, and blue. So the more it's facing towards positive y, the more green it is, the more it's facing towards positive x, the more red it is, and the more it's facing towards positive z, the more blue it is. Important to note is that normal maps are usually in what's called tangent space. That means that these colors are relative to the face they're on, not the world in general, and that the channels go from 0 to 1, so facing in the negative x direction means no red, and facing up is 50. Right. This is different to object space, where the channels actually go between negative 1 and 1. Object space, tangent space. Object space, tangent space. Okay, tangent over. I've got this plane I want to be sheet metal, so let's make a new material for it, and open up the shader editor. Then I need to add some image texture nodes for each of the images I want to pull in, so one for color, one for roughness, and one for my normals. Now, for my roughness and normal maps, I need to change the color space of these textures to non-color. That's because I don't intend to display these as colors, and therefore don't want Blender to mess with them in any way. If you forget to do this with textures like the roughness, it won't quite look right, but might be fine. If you forget to do this with a normal map, it'll be a lot more noticeable and definitely give weird results. So next up, I'll change the metallic slider on my shader to 1, because this is a metal sheet, and hook up my textures. So albedo goes into the base color, roughness goes into the roughness, and normal, ah, oh, I almost tricked you there, your normal map doesn't just go right into the normal slot. We can try that, but it uh, definitely does not look right. What we need is a normal map node. So I can just hit shift A to add a new node, go to vector, then normal map. Now I just hook up my normal map to the normal map node and hook that into the normal slot on my material. And well hey, that's all you need to do to hook up a normal map. If the place you got the material from set it up correctly, you shouldn't need to touch anything on the normal map node except for maybe the strength, in case you really want to over or underemphasize the height of the details, but that usually isn't necessary. Okay, that's normal maps down. What about bump maps? Well, bump maps, also known as height maps, are often used in a similar way to normal maps, but instead of encoding direction, they encode height, and then the shader uses that height to figure out the normals, instead of giving you the normals directly. What do I mean by they encode height, exactly? Well, let's say I've got this plane. It's flat and it's sitting at Z0, so let's color it black. Now, I want to add some bumps to it, so I'll turn on proportional editing, grab some random points, and lift them up. You can see now that the higher the points are, the brighter they get, and this is literally all a height map is. The brighter the point, the higher it is. The lower, the darker. Simple. Okay, so now we know what a bump map is, how do we use one? Well, let's go back to that metal plate material. You might remember that, as well as normals, they also provided a height texture. So let's test it out. Make another image texture node, bring in the height, make sure it's non-color, and add a bump node by hitting Shift A, Vector, Bump. Now, we plug our texture into the height, not the normal, and plug the node into the normal input on our shader, and whoa, this is way too strong and steep. Let's fix that. Your first instinct might be to reach for the strength slider, but no, bad. If there's one thing you should remember from this video, make it this. The strength slider on the bump node should only be used for mixing different bump maps or if you need to animate the height for some reason. If you want to change the overall steepness of the bump map, use the distance. But we need a little bit of explanation on what the distance actually does. Basically, as I said earlier, the bump map is a black and white image, so every point has some brightness value between 0 and 1. But what do 0 and 1 actually mean in terms of height? Well, that's what the distance is asking for. What is the height difference, or distance, between 0, the darkest value, and 1, the lightest value? For the bump node, it's asking for this value in blender units, which is equivalent to meters. Back to our material, I can't imagine the major bumps on this plate be more than like a couple centimeters tall, so I just put 0.02 into the distance, and now that looks a lot more reasonable. If we compare it to the normal map, yeah, that looks about right. Now, to be honest, this isn't exactly close to a real-world example of where you'd want to use a bump map. If you're downloading material or asset off the internet, and it comes with a normal map, 9 times out of 10, you should just use the normal map. It's easier to set up, and more exact. The reason this material even came with a height map is for displacement, which is a whole thing and deserves a video all on its own. So where or why would you want to use a bump map over a normal map? 
Well, the simple reason is that bump maps are more, well, simple. At least when it comes to making them. If I want to make a normal map, I have to deal with baking, and tangent space, and object space, and math, and ugh. But literally, any black and white texture can be a bump map. If I'm making this procedural rock material here, I wouldn't even know how to start making a normal map to use with it. But I can just take one of these noise textures, slam it into a bump node, pick a reasonable distance, and boom, my rock is suddenly looking a lot more rocky. Plus, if I want to add multiple layers of bump maps, it's really easy because the bump node has a normal input. So I can take this lower detail noise texture, get a bump node for, and then just plug its output into the other bump node, and the two just work together perfectly. Additionally, and I'm not going to get into this right now because it also could be its own separate video, bump maps are a lot easier to manipulate and mess with using node map, which is all but necessary in complex procedural materials. So basically, if you already have a normal map, you should use it over a bump map, and if you're trying to share your work with others, you should probably be making and giving them normal maps too. But if you're working with procedural materials, or generally just building stuff up from scratch, bump maps are simpler, faster, and more versatile. Okay, so, recap. Normals are extra vectors stored inside of a mesh to tell the rendering engine where any given face is pointing. We can interpolate between the normals on different faces in order to smooth them out visually. This is called smooth shading and is just an option in Blender. It's not perfect though, so make sure you have enough geometry or the object is far away enough to not notice the artifacts. As well as messing with existing normals, we can add detail using a normal map, which changes the direction parts of faces are pointing, the same way a color texture changes the color of different parts of faces. Normal maps won't be as nice as having the detail actually there because they don't cast shadows, but that's fine so long as you keep it to small and short details. To use a normal map you've downloaded, just load it into an image texture node, set the color space to non-color, plug that into a normal map node, and plug that into your BSDF. You use a bump map similarly to a normal map, but instead of being an RGB texture, it's just black and white, and it encodes height instead of direction. To use a bump map you've downloaded, load it into an image texture node, set the color space to non-color, plug it into the height input of a bump node, and plug the output into your BSDF. Control the steepness of the effect using distance, not strength. The way the distance works is that it sets the difference in height between the tallest, brightest parts of the bump map and the darkest, lowest parts. Set in Blender units which is equivalent to meters. Generally, you'd want to use normal maps when you have them, i.e. if you've downloaded a material or asset off of the internet, but if you're getting procedural and making your materials from scratch, you're going to want to use bump maps because they're easier to make, easier to layer, easier to mess with through node map. Whew. Okay, so that's it. That's all you reasonably need to know and more about normals, normal maps, and bump maps. I've linked to the example material I used in the description in case you really want to use it yourself. And if you like this video, consider subbing to the channel. I'll probably post more videos like this on other topics I think I can teach people about alongside any more music I release. So make sure to look out for that. In the meantime, I'll see you next time.